Dear beloved in the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. This time you may be seated. And let us go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we give thanks to you for each day that you have blessed us with, each day that we know is a gift from you, a day that you sustain us, that you guard and keep us. Help us each day to come to you by the power of your Holy Spirit, seeking after you because of our salvation in Christ. Lord, may we confess you as the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the day set aside for the Trinity. Set aside for our faith in God. Now every day should be a day that we honor God, that we serve God and obey God. But today we specifically talk about God in His three persons, in His one substance. Today we talk about God in a way that sometimes we struggle to. We have the word, we use the word, but we don't always know what it means. We don't necessarily have something that we can compare it to on this earth. Certainly there have been ways that people in the past have compared it to, whether it be an apple or an ice or a clover leaf. All of those imperfect because still we trust God and believe in God by faith alone. Trinity is a word that's not found in Scripture. Our non-Christian friends will point that out to us. You can go through the pages, and I challenge you to do so. And while the word, though, is not present, not used until Tertullian, who was uh, born in 155 A.D., so nearly 100 years after, it does not mean that the Trinity is not present in Scripture. It does not mean that God is not represented that way. He has not represented himself that way because he has. He has shown himself, and not only from the beginning, as we looked at Genesis today, but from before the beginning. If we go all the way back before the beginning, Paul gives us this little picture as to what was going on. We really don't know what much of what happened before the foundation of the earth, before Moses penned those words of what happened in the beginning. But Paul gives us this brief glimpse, this brief glimpse into the fact that the triune God was already present before the foundations of the earth. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, we see that not only was a triune God there, but the plan for salvation was already laid down. Paul writes, Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, before the foundation of the world, the triune God was. Before our beginning, what we mark as the beginning, God was. As I often tell my confirmants to do, we also see, though, already in the beginning, the first three verses of Genesis, we have the triune God represented. We see the Trinity already there in those first three verses. The Father Father spoke. The Spirit hovered over the waters of the deep. And the Son, He was the Word made flesh. Now, it's true we have to go to John 1 and look at the first three verses of John, but when you look at those first three verses, just listen to the way John describes the creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit present in the tri- at the foundation of the earth. The Lord Jesus is the one who gives us movement and breath and the one who gives us that, 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 that ability to, to worship. And if we read a little bit further, we notice that in creation, God took this world that was without form or with end void, and He made His perfect shalom, His perfect peace, His perfect order. He took this world that, well, Really, there was nothing there. Because if we go back to those first couple words, tohu vavohu, and I'd invite you to say it with me, but just kind of say it in your mind with you, tohu vavohu, because those words are so important. Those words mean formless and void, but it's tohu there, the first word. It's not just formless, as if there was a lump of clay already present, or as if constellations were flying by God's head when he created the earth. No, that word tohu, it means chaos, confusion, and even emptiness. Because before the beginning, there was only God. And then God brought order and peace. 
to everything. And God created the world with perfect order. If you look through those pages of of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and as we read through them today, hopefully you heard again that it wasn't just kind of random that God said to himself one day, you know, today I feel like light, and the next day he felt like water. But he went through, and he specifically each day created. And then you notice after the first three days, he decorated. That's how I like to say it. He, he took those days, and after he separated and created the lights in the sky, he put in stars in the sky. Then on the fifth day, he decided to fill the air and the waters. And then the sixth day, the crown of his creation, us, all created in his perfect peace and in his perfect order until sin entered the world. Until sin entered the world, There was shalom. But tohu vavohu returned. Formlessness and voidness. Chaos returned because sin, that's what sin brings, is chaos into our lives and into our hearts. God in His perfection, He creates order, but but here, how many of our lives are in order? Maybe one or two days we can say. Maybe we can get in order our finances for a time, but... How many of us can say every aspect of our lives are in order because of sin's entrance into the world? Certainly not, can we? It's hard for us to wrap our minds around this, to wrap our minds around God in three persons who is perfect, who is at peace when we live in such chaos, in such confusion. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around it because we are, after all, sinful human beings. And when we look at it, it, how many of the things in the Bible is it hard for us to wrap our minds around? Yes, God in three persons, but how about creation in six days? Or the Son of God being present in the Lord's Supper? Salvation coming for the whole human race by one man. How many of those things do you struggle to wrap your mind around? Do you understand them perfectly? The greatest theologians in the world don't. We talk around them. We talk about them. But truly the only way that we can even come close to believing, understanding them is by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It is only by the work of the Holy Spirit that we can obtain these understandings by faith. And even then, with our brokenness, with our sinfulness, we cannot fully understand. Even then, we live in this chaos, this tohu vavohu. And sometimes, we're content to live in this chaos. We're content to live in this chaos because it gives us an out. It gives us an excuse for our sinfulness. It gives us opportunity to say, well, the Lord is in control, but maybe not of everything. And So we make excuses in our lives. We make excuses about the way our lives go. We look at sin in our lives and we, and we talk about it as if it's not as bad, as if it's not as chaotic as it seems. We talk about sin as if it's on a graduated scale. We look and we say, you know, I can be rude, I can be cold and uncaring, I can make snide remarks, I can gossip, but that's not nearly as bad as someone who murders the bank robber who steals people's fortunes. Many men and women look at pornography. They convince themselves that if they look at pornography, it's not nearly as bad as as cheating on their spouse because at least they're not engaging in a physical affair. Many people, they tell lies. Maybe they convince themselves it's a little white lie. It's a half-truth. I mean, that's not as bad as defrauding uh, hundreds of thousands of veterans of their benefits. It's not nearly as bad as the investor who swindles countless families out of their life savings. And we rationalize, don't we? We rationalize our lives and we make excuses and, and, we, and we live in this chaos because at least then we don't have to face ourselves. We don't have to take an honest look at our heart. We don't have to look and see who we truly are and if whether or not we're living in the peace of God or content in that chaos. But when we look back to the creation, the foundation of all, when we look at back to the order in which God built creation, 
the fact that we are made in the image of God, both male and female, made in the image of God, we realize God did not ever intend for us to live in chaos. God didn't ever intend for us to look at our sin as if it did okay, as if he wasn't in control of it all. God never intended for us to balance our sin as if there was a gray area or a graduation. In fact, in James chapter 2, he writes, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in just one point has become accountable for it all. See, God, he has two standards. Either you're perfect or you're not. God either has black or or white. And here as we sit, when we're honest with ourselves, we know who we are. We're saints. I thought I was going to say sinners, but we have a promise, something greater than the law of this world. Yes, we're intended to follow God's law, but we could never perfectly do that. Yes, we, we, we could try and we could stress and we could strain and we could work and work and try to, to, to just take away the chaos in our lives. We could never do that. There is only one who could, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is the one who came into this earth, who bound himself, although almighty, he bound himself to one human form. Although he was eternal, he bound himself to one time, to one place. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he came into this world. And although he lived a perfect life, not even sinning in his thoughts. He died for us. Gave his life for us. And so instead of saying we are sinners, we are black to the core, which indeed we were until we were baptized into the triune name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At that point, instead of, being, instead of going before God as the sinners that we deserve to, we go before God as saints, those who have been forgiven, washed and made clean. We go before God, not as those who deserve only his wrath and punishment, which is what we did deserve. But instead, Jesus took that wrath and punishment. He dr drank that cup of wrath for us. And so instead, we come before God, washed and made clean in the blood of our Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we go before him with the hope and promise that our lives of tohu vavohu, our lives of chaos, of emptiness, that He comes into our lives and He brings shalom. He brings peace. He brings peace that is beyond our comprehension and understanding. And I'd like to share with you, just a, uh, this is a theologian, Cornelius Platinga. And he wrote a book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. And this is how he describes shalom. And I want you to listen close because it's more than just what we might say peace, ending wars, but listen to the way he describes it. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation is injustice. Fulfillment and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. The way things ought to be. And that is what the Spirit brings in our lives, in our hearts. The way things ought to be. Things that we could never bring into our own lives, into our own hearts. The Spirit brings that shalom, that peace. He brings to us that hope of the resurrection. He leads us to the cross where we confess our sins. He leads us to the promise of forgiveness that we have. We don't just look forward to the day of the resurrection, but we live the resurrection each day. We live the peace that it will bring each day of our lives. And we don't do so alone, but the Lord has promised that he will send the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And the Lord Jesus has sent his Spirit. He has sent his Spirit to lead us each day, to guide and direct us. He has spent, sent his Spirit to inspire our lives and our hearts. That even when we 
live comfortably in that chaos. Even when we live comfortably letting the world go by around us. He emblazons in our heart the Word of God, the truth of God's Word. He reminds us of our purpose here. That we weren't just randomly created. That we weren't just one more part of the creation. A beast, a fish, or a bird. But we have been created with purpose and design. We have been created in the image of, the, of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have been created to serve Him, to obey Him. To share His love with others. As I told the kids, as you take that invitation of the Word, it is not your words that you bring, but it is the Word of God that you bring. It is not your hope that you bring, but it is a hope that, that is embedded in the pages of Scripture. It is the Word made flesh that you share. The Trinity is not something that we'll fully understand this side of creation. But what we do know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all working constantly for our salvation, our sustenance, that one day we may be with Him forever. May the peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds now and always. Amen. Please pray with me. Holy Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank You that you have entered into this world and that you, have, that you have created this world in order, that you have taken the tohu vavohu, the chaos and the confusion, the formlessness, and you have made the beauty of our creation. We know that because of sin's entrance into creation, that things sometimes are chaotic, out of control, that we don't always appreciate the beauty of your creation around us. Forgive us for those times. Send your Spirit to be among us and upon us, that our hearts may burn with a passion for you, that we may burn with your truth, that we may burn with your hope. Lord, send your Holy Spirit that we might seek after you, that we might confess our sins, repenting of them, but know that we are forgiven because of your Son, Christ Jesus. And Lord, may we live each day as those with a purpose for you. This we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.